marvellous. Here we go. In people come. Oh, Leanne, here we are for another week. Another Friday, Wesley. The it's Fridays come around so quickly these days. As we were saying before, the sense too of what a Friday looks like is how is it different to a Saturday or a Thursday? Or, you know, there's all these kind of days seem to meld into each other. Just yeah. seeing people coming in. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming in. We see Eden and Millie and Peter uh, and Catherine and Xenia, I think, uh, or, or Xenia. Uh, please excuse me if I get the name pronunciation not quite right. Thanks for coming in. But yeah, these, these weeks, uh, they're, they're full on, aren't they, Leanne? I mean, and, I, and I think because of the restriction of our movement, I sort of understand why, why it bleeds into every day seems like every other day because you're just spending these times and these spaces that, you know, you're not going to an office or, you know, uh, anything like that. So the routine is really broken. And um, I just sort of wake up and it's like Groundhog Day for me. Yeah. <laughs> you might be just go, what day is it? I've turned into my grandfather who goes, oh, it's 11 o'clock. It's time for morning tea. Uh, it's, you know, and I've just been like, I'm, I'm going, what will I have for dinner? Well, I better think about that because I'll need to plan for it all and things like that as well. I know, Terry, if, you, if you're getting like that, are you getting a bit kind of organising your day in different ways? Yeah, it's, it's hard. But, yeah, like you were talking before about the Zoom meetings there, you have to be like one after the other. Mm. Always mm. like be able to have some time to have a rest but now you're like struggling to to get to the next is it webex zoom skype crazy and we're becoming so good at all of that stuff too how are we going to move from thing to thing lyndon you're you're working at a university and you must be doing a lot of remote work as well so we are we're, but it's been actually very productive working from home because i've got a lot of writing done that i wouldn't normally have got done yeah because of a lot of travel and field work that has now been suspended, uh, conferences that have been cancelled. So it's given a lot of opportunity to start writing some more papers, which has been very great and relaxing actually working from home. But yeah. the Zoom meetings are a little bit, um, <laughs> uh, get, get a little bit much sometimes. But um, apart from that, it's, it's, it's been quite pleasurable to be really productive at home. Excellent. Hey, just um, seeing a few more people come in there. I saw uh, Wayne Barker saying hello, which is great. Um, um, Ellen Van Even again, hello, welcome. Many people coming, good repeat offenders, what's the right term? People coming back and back and all the time. Mm. Kath Pappas, good. Oh, I owe you an email, Kath. Yes, good. Good reminder as you come in today. <laughs> Sarah Bell, Trish Ajay. Great to see people kind of coming in. We've got about 20 people uh, in the attendees there hey just a little reminder for those who are speaking in the chat room just to make sure that you're going for all panelists and attendees so you can talk to the whole room when you can there's a little blue button in the chat room you can just hit that and go all panelists and attendees so you can have conversations with people uh all of us if you want to um in that way not just the panelists and things as well oh. so yeah great We've got about 28, 29 people kind of joining us now. I see yeah. Ian Collis coming in there. Joe Andreessen's there. Great to see you. Um, Michael Hutchings, lots of um, people uh, touching base. Um, Leanne, I just know that you're working from home a lot. We were just talking before about the telecommute, <laughs> they call it now, that all these meetings, as Terry was saying, go just they butt up right up against each other now. So, you know, people who, who normally... You know, you, you, you wrap up a meeting and you take time to reflect on things, but now it's all go, go, go. I mean, mm, is, that, yeah. is that what you're feeling as well? How is it, how's it working for you? Absolutely. Look, I, and, and as most people know, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm running a whole heap of different programs and projects that I'm doing. And so the demand of that and the information that people want is, yeah, it's really hard to get that reflection or that breath between Zooms. Um, and there is a real different way of, you know, the brain operating. We don't see those human nu nuances of, as we do it sitting face to face in meetings. And so there's, there's something that's missing there. And I think that's tiring on the brain. 
Yeah. I mean, I know the Australian um, had a great article they did a couple of weeks ago about really how that affects the brain pathways um, and that the brain is actually operating harder because we're trying to find those social cues that we're used to when we're meeting face to face with people. I, so I, there is a real tiredness that does occur. I also find culturally that like even just what I did then, you don't know when to pop in. Like you sit, you sit back and you listen and normally in, in conversation, there's a back and forward and you hear, hear people's breathing and you know, you wait until your time to speak. And I find myself butting in at times. I go, oh, that's not my intention. I feel really bad mannered. Um, mm. You know, I was always taught to wait and listen. And so there's an interesting kind of cultural element here in terms of the way we're communicating um, along the way. I'm seeing lots of people coming in. Um, there's Vince from the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra. Great to have you here. Oh, that's I was also saw, um, uh, Amar or Amar from India who's popped in. Uh, oh, welcome. Have. That's well, fantastic. great to have you here. We've got about 63 people online at the moment, so um, uh, not including our panellists and people in the back room. And some great folk kind of going along. The, oh, here we go. Um, Ian saying, wonderful, the wonderful Leanne and the charming Wesley. That's always good to know. That's very kind. Very kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, great to see, oh, Adam Robinson, good to see you there, cousin. Good to have you online there. Um, but this idea of how we're working and taking in new ways of communicating and how we find a cultural framework for that is interesting. We're, many questions over the last couple of weeks talking about um, d digital sovereignty and hopefully when we're talking to our speakers today, Terry and Lyndon, we'll be able to bring up that idea of what is digital sovereignty in, in this environment. How do we react and work in a cultural framework within a digital environment as well? Um, mm -hmm. uh, lots of people saying that they're loving Terry's necklace. Um, Terry, where, where's your necklace coming from? I don't know, sorry. I just have all of these things that I pull out, but I didn't hear that, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's just that. Um, um, in the chat, lots of people talking oh, about Oh, okay. That there. Thank you. <laughs> um, we've got some people from the Port Ferry Spring Music Festival. We've got Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But so many people coming. I think that uh, especially our panellists today, people are very interested in these ideas of uh, a digital sovereignty, uh, copyright, mm -hmm. and maybe even some practical steps too about how these are being put in place. We've got about 75 people online now there, Leanne. Okay. Um, great people. Uh, from Desert, I see now coming through. Um, oh, Carmel. Hi, Carmel. Well, there you go. Um, lots of people saying hello. If, if you, we'll give you a bit of a briefing in, in a second. It's now four past two. So we normally start about five past as we get everyone in. Just there's a, a chat box that you can open up and you can see everyone kind of getting in there. Um, Jan from Roburn, good to see you there. Also, just for, um, for everyone who's attending, there's also a Q&A box down the bottom. So if you've you know, come across anything that, you, that springs to mind, please jump into the Q&A box. Wesley and I uh, and the team are looking at that. Uh, and so we'll bring those questions. If you want to ask questions directly to Lyndon or Terry or any of us, please, um, yeah, pop them into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to go through those and bring them to everybody here on this round table. We've got 87 people all up now. Um, I see Tess Vincent has popped in, uh, Vanessa Crosby, oh, um, Wesley Morris, deadly name there, Wesley. Um, Tina Baum there also joining in. Stephanie Parkin, good to see you then. Uh, Kaz, good to have you here. Oh, Sonia Carmichael, great to have you on board. Uh, Sonia Smolica, who's also on the strategy panel for the Australia Council as well. Great to see you there, Sonia. Um, yes, uh, everyone's kind of coming in, I know, um, to, to talk about these issues. And we're just hitting five past two now. And we've just uh, got 88 people online. We might start in just another minute there, Leanne. When yeah, that'd be great, Wesley. Um, I've just noticed someone's come in from um, Vancouver as well. Welcome from um, the, our Northern Hemisphere, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, it's good to be I'd love to go to Vancouver one day. I've never been to Canada. Oh, I've been all the time. It's cold up there. 
got good bacon. <laughs> That's, you know, some amazing things. Um, oh, um, I see that Stephanie Parkin is there with her sister Delvine and um, Annie Evelyn. Um, just a little bit of a side note. Annie Evelyn uh, was one of my mother's best friends when they were growing up in, in Brisbane. So there's a little connection. Hi, Debbie. Good wonderful. to see you there. All right. Well, we might get started then, Leanne. Are you ready yeah. to go? Let's get started. Oh, marvellous. All right. Um, yep. We might start the PowerPoint then, Michelle. Oh, we might just pop back to the beginning. There we go. Here we are. Hello and welcome. I'm Wesley Enoch and I'm joined by the wonderful Leanne Buckskin. And we're here to talk at the First Nations Arts Roundtable. And I think this is number 10, if I remember correctly. It number certainly 10. is. Oh. It's number 10, Wesley. How did that happen? It just goes on and on, doesn't it? It's amazing. Um, today we're talking about protecting our cultural knowledges and heritage. And it's the 22nd of May, Friday, the 22nd of May. Next slide, please. As I was saying, I'm Wesley Enoch, um, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Sydney Festival, and I'm also the Chair of the First Nations Art Strategy Panel, and the wonderful Leanne Junipa Buckskin, who's the Deputy Chair of the Australia Council for the Arts. And Leanne, I might hand over to you to say hello and maybe acknowledge country for us. Thank you, Wesley. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our 10th round table. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I sit on Ghana land, uh, the uh, Adelaide Plains, and um, I acknowledge our elders uh, past, present and emerging, and also our ancestors that surround us um, every day as we go about our business, but also acknowledging all the countries uh, and uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, right across our lovely nation. I'm sitting here in Eora country, Gadigal country in, in the Sydney area. And I'd just like to do a little shout out to my Kwandamooka family who are in and listening to today as well. Great to have you on board. Next slide, please, Michelle. Just to remind everyone, we're here to, to share, to connect with each other, share um, our experiences, but also our ideas and to network together as well. You can actually, I'll talk about this in, in a second, but there's ways of connecting with each other and seeing who else is on board and developing and strengthening the networks around the nation. And we're trying to together navigate our way through this COVID-19 experience. But I think also it's not just about COVID-19, it's also bringing up a lot of issues around our mental health, about our cultural health, about the way we work uh, as, a community in this particular environment. And as we were saying at the very beginning, before we started, this sense too of the cultural um, issues in this digital world, that things can be shared so quickly, what should be, what shouldn't be, what copyright laws are in place. I mean, Leanne, you're working in a lot of these kind of digital technologies all the time. How we navigate that seems to be a, a big issue. Yeah, it certainly is. And it, it every week, I think, you know, throughout um, this period of time, there is that, that, that question around, you know, if we put our cultural content on the screen, how are we going to be protecting that? Um, and I think that, you know, these are some of the questions that Terry perhaps can uh, help navigate, as well as Lyndon and his work. Mm -hmm. um, but the very interesting questions. And I think that not only for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sector, this is a question that's asked being asked right across the sectors at the moment. Well, I know lots of people are, uh, are coming into these round tables because in, in many ways, the First Nations debates and discussions that we're having in this round table are relevant to many practitioners uh, around the country and around the world, as we're now starting to find. Uh, we've got um, Dan Mitchell, Jason Passfield. We have uh, Sharina Clanton, who's been a wonderful contributor. Uh, we've got Kylie Belling, who was here last week, in fact, talking a little bit from her experience uh, in, uh, in Victoria at uh, Creative Victoria. Uh, and uh, Justine Dillon as well has popped in. Next slide, please, Michelle. Just to give a little sense of uh, the, what we're about to do, I'll, I'll go in a second to talk a little bit about the housekeeping, about how you can navigate the site, especially if you haven't been here before. And we'll be looking at some of the key issues and questions arising out of last week's webinar. And I know, Leanne, you were at the, a board meeting of the Australia Council last week, so I'm going to look at bringing you up to speed about how some of the debates and discussions happened last week. Our guests today, Dr. Terry Janke and Dr. Lyndon Ormond-Parker, 
uh, who will be talking uh, about their practice and especially in these areas of protecting and looking after our cultural heritage. We'll go through about what's next, how we're working collectively, and also some of the resources that are available uh, in terms of industry on the website, Facebook, and some of the grants update and talking about our next round, round table as well. Lots of amazing things. Lots of, yeah, Vanessa Rasso, love the doctors, go girls. Um, I think that's for all of us. Uh, and Preston Peachy, great to have you on board as well. Next slide, please, Michelle. Um, for those who haven't navigated this website before or this, this platform before, if you take your cursor and you take it down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of icons down there. There's one that says participants and there's 106 of us online at the moment. Um, you can tap on that and you can see who's there and you can scroll up and down and look at the names that are there and what the relationships are. The next button across is Q&A or the question and answer box. You can tap on that and Sharina Clanton's asking already, are there minutes being made of these meetings and say, uh, yes, there are recordings, Sharina. You can actually get on the Australia Council website and see all the recordings of this. I don't know if there are written minutes as such, but I know that there are recordings so you can listen to them all. We might ask the back room to answer that for you, Serena, if there's um, anything uh, there, because I imagine there's maybe some feed into the closed captioning that could be useful. But that Q&A button there, if you have a question of the panelists uh, or Leanne or myself, and if we can't answer it, we might even be able to tap into people in the back room who can uh, answer those questions for you as well. Uh, alongside there, you can actually see a chat icon. And that is, if you double click that, it'll open up and you'll see lots of people chatting there. I see Helena Goulash already popping in and saying hello uh, to the panelists there. Great to see you, Helena. Uh, and Mary uh, Spies Williams. Um, popping in to say hello. And as I mentioned before, the next icon along is the closed caption. If in fact, um, you know, you, it's better for you to read what's going on, there's a closed caption offer there that you can tap on that and get a little bit more detail. As I alluded to, all of this is recorded and you can tap into, uh, through the Australia Council website, all of the previous uh, webinars we've done now. This is number 10. So we've been here for two and a half months so every Friday talking about these issues and kind of getting uh, together with ev everything as well. Uh, yes, Shireen is saying that she's onto the, the closed caption full transcript, get the notes made uh, for her own viewing and sit on the meetings. Yep, excellent, well done. Uh, and there's lots of different ways that you can get involved. There's 107 of us online now, which is really great. And it gives you some sense of how important these ideas are that we're talking about. Next slide there, please, Michelle. Leanne, we've got this First Nations Arts Awards. We're hosting everything at the moment. Oh, Wesley, <laughs> we're on it. What's going on? <laughs> And look, I'm, I'm a little bit sad, though. I'm really sad that we, I mean, look, COVID's happened and look, it's going to be a wonderful, I always love hosting with you, Wesley. Uh, as we all know, it's that time of the year where Reconciliation uh, Week is coming up and we know that the 27th is the key date for our First Nations Arts Awards. So this year is going to be different, Wesley. You're going to be in Sydney. I'm going to be here in Adelaide and we're going to be crossing live, um, hosting from two different states. Um, and uh, what we've got is uh, that's coming up on the 27th uh, at 6 p.m. So if you're in any other state, look at your time zones for that. But the important thing to this year, we've got an app. Um, so if you go to the Australia Council website, um, please download the app because what it'll enable you to do is interact um, on the award night and um, you can send messages of con congratulations to the recipients and to, um, to the winners as well. So um, please um, go there, download it and um, chat throughout the awards. Um, we would really love that. I'm just seeing that Joanne Brown has put the link into the chat box there for the Australia Council uh, page that looks at the National Indigenous Arts Awards. And these awards have been going since 1993. So, you know, they're older than me. That's how young I am. Um, and that whole idea of, uh, especially the Red Ochre Award that people will know, which is a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, this amazing thing. And so, as you were saying, Leanne, you'll be in Adelaide, 
I'll be here in Sydney and my beard will be so long it'll be in the ACT. So it'll be this <laughs> wonderful sense of us all coming together through facial hair. So we'll wait and see. <laughs> and some interesting things coming up as well. I know that there's lots of conversation going on around opening state borders at the moment, and especially about tourism. I'm interested too in the conversation coming out of um, New Zealand in Aotearoa, talking about a four day working week as well to help stimulate the economy through more leisure time for people. This could be an interesting kind of development as well. Look, I think um, that is amazing. And I've always said that we should be working a four day a week. Uh, I think one of the Nordic countries has done that already. Um, I mean, they're quite progressive around that sort of arrangement. And um, look, I think it's really taught us something too, Wesley, that people have probably been in a situation where they're now valuing more of their time at home with family being there. Um, you know, I know in my neighbourhood, uh, you know, I just, I love the sense of families just going out and walking together. I mean, prior to COVID, I really didn't see that. But now I saw, see more of family connectedness, togetherness. And so I think we'll come out of this with a very different way of thinking about working in the future. Well, but I'd say also our community responsibilities mean that, you know, yes, you go to do your paid work. But in fact, your community responsibilities also need time and attention. And it just feels like the rest of the world is learning that, you know, that it, you, your community is just as important and how you build your relationships and have the conversations and, and debates and arguments with your relatives, as we all do, that there's a sense that we need to give um, more time to that, be it at a cafe, be it around a, a meal together. And it's, as you're saying, how we build community in that way. That's some very interesting uh, points of view going on. Mm -hmm. And we might go to the next slide then, Michelle. Just a, a little bit of a, a, a recap of what we achieved and talked about last week. People remember that Nancy Bamagandi, Nancy, uh, came in and she talked a little bit about her business model and ha her career and what's come up for her. She has a, a, a production company, a business called Bamaga Productions, where she's working with festivals and different summits and gatherings and looking at uh, especially the coming of the light, which is a, a significant anniversary in 2021 of the coming of the light. People, and it was interesting when, when Nancy was talking last week, that some of us in this country don't know what the coming of the light means as well. Not just, you know, non-Indigenous Australia, but also, you know, the other Australians don't know, or even First Nations Australians don't always know the detail and that the coming of the light is talking about the coming of the Christianity, if you like, to the Torres Straits at the time. Wonderful sense of doing that. And her big thing that I remember her saying was all about young people and how we support and mentor young people that's a big thing for you, Leanne, too. You always talk about young people a lot and how you mentor them through. Yeah, look, I think that, um, and those who have worked with me know that that's really at the heart of what I do. I've really dedicated myself to supporting and mentoring young people, particularly into this industry. And I think one of the um, issues is around uh, youth and, and what we've been going through in the creative industry is I'm, I'm really interested on retention what happens post this and how do we grow? I'm always keen to grow the next generations of arts leaders. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I don't think that right across the sector, we do that well. Um, you know, there's days now where, you know, traineeships are no longer available. You know, so how do you get into the sector? How do you cut your teeth? You know, we know that through volunteering on festivals and things like that is a way to do it. But how do you sustain a career in the arts or enter the arts industry? Well, we might pose that question to, to the, the gathering too. If you have a suggestion or if you have a something that works well for you, get into the, the chat box and just either throw up a little comment about what you think about the next generation, how to work with them. If you have a link to a project you've done as well, Put them all in there because that's a, a very important thing because Vanessa here is saying retention is a big issue and I don't think there's a strategy for the arts and it's probably where research needs to go as well there, Leanne. Um, that this idea yeah, terrific. Of more conversations around that. 
Um, Kylie Belling, who's actually online in, in the room at the moment, talked really articulately about what they're doing at Creative Victoria in terms of introducing the self-determination, um, uh, well, there are 11 principles of self-determination, and in the next slide we'll talk about that, but she's just talking too about the things that they're rolling out. I must say, the Victorian government seemed to be bringing a lot of new money to the table to help support the arts and cultural sector, and that uh, Kylie's been at the forefront, I think, by uh, getting new programs out there for First Nations artists in Victoria to really develop uh, some, some, some new ways of doing it post uh, COVID-19. Uh, just looking at that strategic investment fund of $13 million, which, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, but $13 million go doesn't go far enough, to be honest. We could always do with more. And that sense of support for uh, sustaining and building um, the, those artistic outcomes. So and I, the big challenge is for First Nations artists to get out there and take advantage of some of these things. Um, we've seen that Vanessa's there saying too that the DCA and WA has some grants up to 15 uh, grand uh, with no oh. deadlines at the moment. Well, watch out, some of these monies, when they run out, they run out. So get in early as soon as you can to get your applications there. I know the uh, Australia Council has its monies as well. And uh, you can, there's a little link there um, looking at the, uh, the programs at Creative Victoria. We might go to the next slide there, please, Michelle. That uh, these 11 principles, I was quite fascinated by these 11 principles. And it came out of a bit of a discussion around uh, the treaty process and treaties in Victoria as well. I know uh, the, there's a lot of discussion going on about treaty in Victoria as what there are in Queensland and lots of different jurisdictions around the country. Mm -hmm. So some wonderful things there around cultural integrity, cultural safety, about investment strategies, finding equity, partnerships and decision making, and that how they define those 11 points is really useful. If you find these 11 points um, interesting to you and you, you haven't got time to write them all down, as I see Terry Janke, go for a pencil to try to write them all down quickly. <laughs> um, what you, they'll be on our website, of the Australia Council website. You can go back and have a look at those as well. Um, uh, Sasha MacArthur is saying retention is an issue here in British Columbia. She's in uh, Vancouver, by the sounds of it, as well. And most of the solutions around it is in development of mentorship opportunities and collective building. She's saying that mentorship, as we as um, well, Leanne, you're you're much older than I am. I'm only was born in '93. But this idea of... You're Kate Wesley. <laughs> I'm saying this because Glyndon's going to out me as an old man in a second. But this, this idea of how um, we, as people who've had more experience, make sure we do pass on these experiences to young people. That it also is the responsibility of those coming into our mid-career and, and, and uh, elder status for some of us as we get older, how we look after the next generation as well. Anyway, I what... guess, Wesley, just to add to that as well, in terms of, you know, I think retention is such a big area and particularly when we're faced with 47% of our sector out of work and not being able to access JobKeeper. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, because we freelance, we, we, a lot of us and what's the feedback is, is that we're casual people and we don't necessarily work for an organ one organisation for 12 months, which, you know, gives us access to Centrelink. So, you know, what is that saying to the younger generations about, you know, a career in the arts when something like this happens and, um, you know, there's just such unemployment, yeah. uh, you know, and that's, I think there's a lot of work ahead of us. Well, to know, think about that for the future. One visual artist was talking to me about, you know, they were just ready to, to go in to get Job Seeker and they sold a painting, which meant that they then couldn't get Job Seeker until, you know, until after the next period of time. So, you know, they're mm. not necessarily always rewarded because these monies can come in as lump sums. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, can I just say that this is how old I am. Sharina Clanton just said, I just took a photo of those 11 things on my phone, Wesley. What's your problem? You know, it's like, what do you mean write this out on a pen and paper? So she kind of giving me... What do you of, mean? <laughs> yeah, so go, oh, that makes sense, doesn't it? But that just proves how my brain works. So maybe I'm a little bit older than 1993. Yes. Uh, uh, Sharina also saying she got pen and paper there too. Telling me, yeah, you're not too old. Yeah, thank you, Sharina. Always good to know. Um, just saying that uh, the, there's 
wonderful materials here and you can access all of this again in a second uh, if you go to the Australia Council website. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Michelle. So we've got our two speakers and we'll be speaking in this order. Um, we've got the two doctors. The doctors are in the house today. Uh, we've got Dr. Terry Janke, uh, uh, what's the Miriam uh, woman? She's a solicitor, director of the Terry Janke and Company. We'll get to hear from her in a second. And also we have Dr. Lyndon Orman Parker, who's an Ottawa uh, man, who's a senior research fellow at the University of Melbourne. And he'll be talking a little bit about his projects. There's 117 of us online. We're here at the round table, the Australia Council First Nations round table. And it's great to see so many people coming in and talking and sharing their ideas. One of the provocations that Leanne just popped out there for everyone is just to talk a little bit more about what strategies are useful in the development of next generations and how we're looking at it. Um, Ellen Van even saying um, paid skill sharing opportunities. So the idea of how you can share skills, I guess, amongst peers as well. And just uh, th this notion of how intergenerational training and development is possible. That uh, there's, there's no great solutions, Haley um, uh, virtually saying, no great solutions here, but training and development for emerging and younger career artists is essential. And uh, she's only seeing it working in remote artist communities a lot through project mm -hmm. funding. So we might just need to think about that as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And there's a very important aspect, um, uh, Sarah is saying here, as a mid-career artist currently relying on grants and family tax benefits, I'm surprised at how quickly my business income stopped altogether. And many people talking about that, how things kind of come to a close. Leanne, I might pass on to you to just introduce our Dr. Terry Jenke. Thank you, Wesley. Um, hi, Terry. It's so good to see you. I'll get you to just, yeah, unmute. How are you, Terry? I'm good. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Are you travelling well through this COVID situation? It's okay. I'm going all right. Yeah. It's different, but it's good. Yeah. And, and what about your team at the company? How have you handled with your team and the working? Um, you know, is, this, is everyone working from home? Yes, the office closed. It's probably uh, mid-March that we closed the office and everyone went to work remotely. And that's been going okay. I mean, we're still getting uh, work, people coming in through email and calling us up and it's good. We're connecting more on Zoom. So we have meetings for Zoom and our Monday morning meeting starts with a, uh, a song and a dance for survival and we're just Fantastic. To, um, get the energy and set the positivity for the week to come. Oh, that's really fantastic. So what do you do? All sort of jump up and well, crank I up the music <laughs> and um, boogie around the lounge room. Around the I street. do. But, yeah, some of the others join in. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic way to start a Monday. Mondays are not my good days. I, when, my t when I work with a team um, and you go on leave, never come back on a Monday. I always say mm -hmm. to my team, come back Tuesday. Just that Sunday night thing, you know. But I think um, I, I might take a leaf out of your book. It might, be, might get me um, wiggling on on a Monday. Yeah. <laughs> well, Terry, I'm going to hand it over to you now to present okay. your... And, um, and just, um, yeah, let's, oh, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Terry. Great. Thanks, Leanne. And thanks, Wesley. Hello, everybody. It's good to come on the round table and I'll be speaking to everyone. Today, I am beaming in from Yuen country in Ulladulla on the south coast. So I acknowledge the traditional owners here and I acknowledge the traditional owners where everybody is uh, situated I am Wurthi and Miriam, and I was born in Cairns. So shout out to anyone who's calling in from those countries. Uh, it's, it's good to connect. First slide, please, Michelle. I've got 10 minutes to speak, and I thought I'd do a little bit of a story about my involvement in this area, because some of you would have met me many years ago um, when I actually used to work at the Australia Council. I had a break from law school, which was also known as dropping out, but um, I did find uh, my way back and uh, 
can rest assured everybody, I do have a practicing certificate. That's especially for any clients out there. But um, what uh, I, I was uh, enlightened to when I was at the Australia Council was the need for Aboriginal artists to have advice in copyright and contracts. And it was there that I had that you know, light bulb moment that that could be my pathway back into being a lawyer. Because at the time I'd been very disillusioned by law as it being a very white male um, professional um, uh, area. And I did go back to law school and get my um, degree. And so I'm showing a picture here of my team. Um, that all of us are working remotely. Um, uh, we are um, working nationally and sometimes internationally. Our uh, advisors, um, sorry, our advice is to Indigenous creators, Indigenous businesses and anyone working with them. We act for national and state um, arts agencies and organisations and we love the work that we do. We're very passionate about it and pleased to be celebrating our 20 year anniversary this year. Next one. But I also wanted to say uh, a little bit about uh, my artistic journey as well, because I also love writing and I've wrote a book in uh, 15 years ago, I wrote a novel called Butterfly Song, which basically was a bit autobiographical, but I found it a really great space to reflect on my journey through law school and to link in with the Torres Strait heritage and um, the, the, the butterfly amulet and song that's within that story. But I also um, loved writing and storytelling to be able to connect with my children, which I always would tell them stories. I mean, butterfly song is really reflective of the stories my mother used to tell me. But I also um, have written books with my children, Kin Island with my son, Jake Pitt, and What Makes a Tree Smile with my daughter, Tamina Pitt, which was published by Magabella Books. Thanks, Michelle. So that was all to try and tell you that I'm got cred to talk today or link into the uh, artistic community. And I'm really grateful to be a part of it. It's been uh, a wonderful um, experience for me personally in uh, my career and my personal life. But um, today's topic, cultural heritage. Um, I wanted to um, flash back to some work that I did. It is 21 years ago now. Um, some work that I did was funded by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies and the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission. Back in the day there, um, they funded a project to look at Indigenous cultural and intellectual property and the shortfalls and what should be the future. And I was lucky enough to be working at a firm, Michael Franklin Company, who went ahead with that work. And Our Culture, Our Future, the report that I'm showing on the screen uh, was the result of that. And I remember back in the day there, Joanne Brown, you were working on that with me. And also I, I noticed Sonia Smaller Cone. Um, hello, Sonia. Sonia was involved in that. And some of you would have been involved in the feedback and the um, reference group that put together that work. But what I wanted to talk to um, now was uh, what is Indigenous cultural heritage, what is Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, because when you look at it through a Western lens, cultural heritage is often focused on the physical, tangible part of it. But from an Indigenous point of view, the intangible stuff, the knowledge, the stories associated with that hard cultural heritage is interlinked, just as important, and the type of things that we look for to remain connect, connected with. So this map is just showing the types of things that our culture, our future said uh, were the categories of Indigenous cultural heritage. But I wanted to point out that it's constantly moving and adapting and it's for Indigenous peoples to define what that is. But cultural heritage is coming from place. So people's connection to land, to country, to seas and to sites on there and 
It is also um, historical experiences. It is communally owned, so individuals might be responsible for it, but it is collectively uh, the um, belongings of the community. And it's a living culture. Cultural heritage, um, at least when I started working on this um, and being involved in it in the late 80s and early 90s, and we looked at work being done in the 70s, there was that word folklore that was being used all the time to refer to cultural heritage, which was really demeaning of its status and value to living cultures and for artists, for artists to be able to interact with that and reclaim it, revitalise it and nurture and develop it. And it is cultural too, so it is part of this practice, a practice focus of us being able to care for country or um, develop languages, understand <clears throat> our, um, ourselves and our identity. It is all part of the cultural experience, which is not locked in time, it is continuing and it's a dynamic and Indigenous people want to be controlling. So I'm showing the map, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I've just, you can see there, I've put up some, some examples of the sort of things that are heritage and jewellery is one of them, uh, but also um, it is cultural belongings, photographs, but let's not forget data and also digitised and digitally created works and also databases being put together in collections of Indigenous cultural heritage that are controlled, often not by Indigenous people, but by collections and uh, cultural institutions. Next slide, please. And when we look at how the legal landscape uh, protects cultural heritage, uh, you can see that there are shortfalls in the way that it protects Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And I'm going to look at it through the lens of the copyright law here, because that is the law that protects works of art, films and sound recordings and films. But the gap automatically apparent in the way the copyright law looks at how people can control this sort of content is that it needs to have material form. So the expression is protected. But for Aboriginal art where the style or the theme is important and it might be orally or performance transmitted, it is not protected as the underlying style. Yes, of course, an artist painting a story of a country will own the copyright in that physical work that they created. But the right to paint that story is not protected. Copyright is an individual right as well. It's looking for an individual author. That's not to say that groups of authors can't have joint ownership, they can, but it's not recognising this collective uh, heritage. And ICIP is this communal right. Copyright is based on economic notions of uh, incentivising people to create, except for the moral rights laws, which were put in in year 2000. Indigenous cultural and intellectual property is uh, rights are controlling how it can be used and shared. And these are rights and responsibilities that have a foundation in customary law or cultural protocols. And copyright, you can assign rights, so long as that's in writing. Uh, for Indigenous people, that practice, that culture is handed down through family, through the clan, so those are, uh, uh, people who are given um, contracts that say assign all your rights um, don't really feel that that is um, recognising that continuing connection. And then copyright is limited in its duration. It protects works for uh, the life of an artist plus 70 years. So after that, um, old songs, old stories and rock arts fall into the public domain is the word that um, the that the lawyers use. But for Indigenous people, those old songs, rock art stories are of vital cultural heritage and still very much that cultural practice of being um, something that we are connected with, have the right to own and control, is still very much alive. Next slide, please, Michelle. And we don't have laws in Australia that recognise this right. We can only use the copyright law 
there are some moves within native title and cultural heritage laws if we look at the Victorian amendments um, that are now in the Heritage Act. But Article 31 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has a clear um, message and assertion of the type of rights Indigenous people are seeking to their cultural heritage. And it is the right to maintain, control, protect and develop that heritage. And you can see in the sentences that follow the types of things that are within there, a bit like the summary that I showed you in the map before. But what Indigenous people worldwide are saying is that this is something that we need to control in the same way that intellectual property laws allow control of Western bodies of knowledge. It is uh, linked to Indigenous people's survival, their identity and their rights to continue their cultural dynamics. So um, these are rights we need. Now, this doesn't transform itself directly into Australian law in the same way the Berne Convention Literary and Artistic Works gives us the Copyright Act. Uh, declarations are very low on the rung of international laws. So it comes in as being an influencer of policy only. And in my point of view, um, we need to see more policies and I think really more law influenced by the declaration. Next slide. So in the gaps um, between the laws, um, we um, as Indigenous people um, have been calling for new laws for at least 30, 40 years to, to fill this gap. And it was people like Juan Jack Marika back in the 70s were calling for laws back then. And we're still looking at, at that. And the, there has been no movement really, although many, many inquiries. So in the gap, of this um, protocols have become an important means of having those rights fulfilled. So this is a diagram of the protocols that we use within our work and which are based on um, understandings that we've had over many years of working and advising people, but they are also in the Australia Council protocols for working with Indigenous art forms and also with the film Screen, Screen Australia's Indigenous Protocols. But there's one to 10, they interlink and interlap, overlap, but it's about respecting and acknowledging that Indigenous people have the right to control their cultural heritage, self-determination, that they are the key creatives and kept um, in control. Three is having consent and consultation, prior informed consent and consultation becomes a consideration within arts projects. How do you trigger that and enable Indigenous people to be consulted? Um, in, we see uh, written contracts being um, uh, used, but also um, the question of who is the right person to get consent? How widely do I consent? Uh, how widely do I consult? And I think the idea of having a National Indigenous Cultural Authority, which Lydia Miller and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts Board has been developing, it could really help with that um, principle. Four is interpretation. So Indigenous cultural heritage, it's about Indigenous people having the voice and um, being the ones to um, interpret it. Five is cultural heritage, guarding its cultural um, meaning. Six is the secrecy and privacy, whether there are gender specific laws about men's or, business, or women's business is one thing but also privacy of individuals. Seven is attribution, people being credited, uh, communities, not just moral rights um, of writers, but the owners of stories and traditional knowledge being accredited. Credited. Eight is benefit sharing. So um, that is um, benefits by way of payment for sharing that, but also non-monetary uh, benefits. And nine is maintaining that Indigenous culture. So think about what the impact might be and how the project can continue the links. Um, one example might be, you know, just if you're taking a recording of someone performing and putting in an archive, let their, them know and so future generations can be connecting with that. I find today a lot of the um, things held in museums and collections aren't known by um, the people themselves, let alone their families. 
And 10 is recognition and protection. So using laws, using contracts, using traditional custodians notice, copyright notices and um, protocols to protect your rights. So that's like the protocols framework that um, is being developed in the gaps of the law. Next slide, please, please, Michelle. And what we're seeing is, um, as well as uh, the Australia Council and Screen Australia having protocols that um, assert these rights, there's also responses by cultural institutions to develop these within their systems. So there's a picture there of the National Museum of Australia, who has an Indigenous engagement policy that's uh, looking at these principles and how they manage their collections and uh, mount their exhibitions in response to that. Um, within the science area, a database which is putting together um, species within Australia, the Atlas of Living Australia by CSIRO is using these principles, but also the Museum of Applied Arts and Science, Sciences, the old powerhouse has one. State Library too, which has a lot of content, um, old photographs, um, maps, languages, they're using it and the Film and Sound Archive in Canberra um, that control a lot of old film footage, you know, ceremonial footage, um, who gets access to that, um, how is that um, catalogued and how is it um, referred to is all things that cultural institutions are now having to look at to respect these Indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights because they're holding the, the cultural stories of Indigenous people. Next one. And I just wanted to um, show a picture of me and my family. Um, these are my two children, Jakey and Tamina now. Um, we were, went to the um, Encounters exhibition um, a few years back, but um, it was an interesting for us to go there as a family because you know, museums um, help us connect to the past and stories that uh, we might not have had through you know, the discontinuation of those stories within our family story. And I remember going there when um, that exhibition was on and the Mur, the mask from Mur was on display there. And we'd gone over to the British Museum a year before to try and see it. And we couldn't see it because it was locked in a vault, you know, in the dungeons there, but really important taken away from the Torres Strait um, in the Haddon collection. And there it was on display there. It was a sad day, but a very happy day to see those things and those sort of connections that we as Indigenous peoples have to these seemingly old heritage items revitalise us and keep us strong. And I know that my children were very, very pleased um, to be able to see that old stuff and reconnect with it. So that's me, over and out. That's fantastic, Terry. I mean, there's a number of questions coming through, which you might hold on to those until after Lyndon um, has spoken as well. There might be ways. But I just have one quick question that's come through that's just talking about this digital environment that we're in. Um, and just to talk a little bit about the True Tracks uh, protocols, how we can maybe access them to have a look at those, those things that you've mentioned there, the True Tracks protocols. Where can we access those? And what advice do you have for those organisations that have very quickly moved into this kind of digital environment and is sharing a whole lot of material, um, what you might say to those groups now? Mm, yeah, thank you. You can get a copy uh, from our website of the True Tracks Principles, but um, I really also want to promote the Australia Council, the Indigenous Art Form Protocols, which are available from the Australia Council website, because they follow those principles too. Go there's a revision happening. Shout out to Trish Ajay, who's been um, managing that project, and that will be out um, in the second half of this year. It's just been slowed down a bit through the pandemic but you will be able to access it through them. And there are case studies also available on arts organisations implementing those protocols that are available from our website, but also the Australia Council's website. And I would really recommend you to have a look, look at that. Um, within the digital area, yes, I do think we've, I've had a lot of um, contact from people who are saying, how do we protect our cultural heritage now in the digital realm when people are recording all the time and it's 
our intellectual property or, you know, because it is now a communication to the public and it's more of a permanent record, all that stuff about where does it go, how people can unuse it, become questions that they're all asking. So my advice would be to ask that of the people who are convening the webinars and asking you to be panels or look at the platform with which you're sharing um, your culture and look at the license that people have to own use it and make decisions about whether or not you want to engage because it's creating a permanent record. Um, but they're questions that you need to ask and follow those 10 steps um, to see how you're covered through them. One of the things that I spoke uh, about um, a couple of weeks ago when I did a panel for the Creative Connections, I'm oh, sorry, I did a keynote for the Creative Connections one with Ian Collis, shout out to Ian, was um, using notices in the same way that you see Creative Commons as notices or the copyright notice um, being used when things are put out on um, the internet, is to have a notice about that it's being shared for um, education or for sharing culture, but that the ideas aren't to be copied or appropriated or you don't give permission for it to be unused. And you can go and have a look at that because we did actually have um, wordings of suggested notices that might be useful. Great, thank you. I mean, there's a, a must say in the, in the back room there, we've got Lyndon uh, Orman Parker just churning out the links in the chat box there. He's, every, every time you say something, Terry, Lyndon's there kind of going, oh, here's this link, here's this link. He's, um, he's quick. He's, he's so quick. Oh. Also, <laughs> Thank you, Lyndon. <laughs> Thank you, Lyndon. <laughs> lots of deadly work there. So, and also um, um, Alex is, is saying here that uh, Amaga, the, if I get this right, the Australian Museums and Galleries Association has a 10 year oh. roadmap uh, and there's a link there to, to um, that organize, uh, that work yes. as well. And also- uh, the Shout out to them, shout out to Alex too. And yes, there, there is some great resources there on the Amaga website. Um, my firm works under commission of the Australian Museum and Galleries Association. And we've done a 10 year roadmap, but there's also a very big report, but it has five principles in the first people's report for cultural institutions to, um, change the relationship with Indigenous cultural heritage. And really it's about bringing Indigenous people's voices into those institutions and unlocking um, that for us to connect with and retell, well, tell those stories um, in our voices. There's lots of questions here, Terry, but if, if, with your permission, we might hold on sure. to these and bring you back when after Lyndon's given his um, um, a 10 minute uh, presentation, just because I think that he might also have uh, some opinions about these questions that are coming through. Um, Dr. Lyndon Orman Parker is, uh, well, I'd say a friend as well as an academic. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, sometimes they are, but um, this uh, wonderful sense of uh, all of the work you've been doing, Lyndon, especially in, in some of the earlier work you did, and maybe you're still involved in it, a lot about repatriation and about connection and, and protection of uh, ancestral um, uh, remains, artifacts, um, uh, design items, and how you're doing all that. And um, I might hand straight over to you, Lyndon, to, to talk to us for the next 10 minutes. Great, thanks, Wesley. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. Um, but yes, you're right. I have worked in repatriation for quite a number of years, first starting out in the corporate sector and then moving across to FERA. And shout out to Helena, who was on the board when I first started. This is myself on a road trip uh, to do some community consultations near Birdsville. And I thought I would pick this photo because of the Kuimba Jadara t-shirt, which um, Wesley and um, uh, Lydia were heavily involved in, uh, in the early days. So uh, that was actually one of my favorite t-shirts for quite some time. So next slide, please, Michelle. And here's another photo of Wesley and Deb. Uh, this was at the Battersea Arts Center in the 90s. Uh, so I'd spent a little bit of time in London working on documenting uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ancestral remains collections. Uh, again, that was for Farah. Uh, and so, of course, uh, at the time, uh, uh, Ken Colburn was lobbying for the return of um, his, the ancestor Jagen, who we successfully uh, managed to have returned back to Australia. 
and that work was done while I was working with Farah and uh, Ken and I went to uh, the show at Seven Stages of Grief, wasn't it, Wes? It was, but I think this is a bit of false news because in the 90s, I would have only been about three. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't track you now. And I know because I'm only 39, so I think I'll be better. <laughs> No, Edley, when you think about that, I think this photo is from 1996 or 97, I think it is. 97, I think it was. Yeah, 97, and when we, that show, Seven Stages of Grieving, touring around. Grieving, yeah. Amazing yeah. when you think about, you know, these young people. I know. Who are they? They're not, they don't look like me anymore. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, so, I'm going to talk today about some archiving projects that we've uh, been conducting for almost 10 years now in Water, which is uh, previously known as Port Keats, which is about 300 kilometres south of Darwin, on the coast near the Fitzmaurice River uh, towards the Western Australian border. So, uh, next slide please, uh, Michelle. So, I've been working on the left-hand side is Jacinta Crocom, and that's her father on the right-hand side, Mark Crocom, and Mark's been in the Water community for about 30 35 years, and over that time, he, he's actually created a vast collection of audiovisual recordings of events in the community. Uh, and he's worked for the What Air Museum for many, many years. And so we had this massive collection there. And I did an interview with Mark when I was doing my PhD uh, quite a number of years ago, and he said, I need help with our collection in What Air. And so I sort of promised that we would um, try and help him out. So we Basically, and shout out to my colleague, Dr. Sharon Hubner, who's worked on this project for quite a number of years as well, on and off. Um, so, Michelle, if we could just go back to the last slide. Sorry, and I'll con contextualise this. So we went up and did an audit, and basically there are 750 VHS tapes. And of course, most of these have two to three hours of footage on them. Uh, and of course, we now have what's called uh, 2025 as a call out that all of these old um, magnetic tapes need to start being digitised before 2025 because that's the life shelf of these old tapes. So um, next two slides, please, Michelle. Um, so basically, oh, go back one, sorry. So I'll just keep talking about the project there. So basically we said about, this is a little digitization center here in the What Air Museum. So basically the community wanted to digitize everything on the site. Uh, uh, before it got sent to Canberra uh, and we had negotiated with IAPSIS to take the physical collection. So the building that uh, the museum is in, it's very much a tinderbox, it's not cyclone proof, it was the old hospital. Uh, and so it's very, um, the conditions are very poor for keeping uh, museum collections and especially things like these tapes. There was also 550 mini DV tapes, which many of you will probably still remember. Uh, and they were very small, cassettes and we found that the mini DV tapes were very, very fragile, even though they, were, they came out after VHS and that it was, um, they were very fragile. We couldn't digitize them on site. Uh, we didn't have a tape deck for it. So again, we did a deal with IATSIS to take the collection and digitize it. And they, IATSIS digitized all 550 and have now returned the digital copies back to uh, the museum in Whatair uh, to now sit down and go through all of this footage, which is over two and a half thousand hours of footage, and actually start adding some metadata to it. You know, what were the events? Some of the events are uh, just everyday community life. Uh, there's about six hours of um, the building of the first airstrip in one air uh, footage. And, you know, given that we're in a slow TV sort of day and age, uh, it, it could be actually quite a popular thing for um, something to be played on SBS, perhaps. Uh, so, and we've also got language, lang most of the material is in local languages, uh, including Murrumbatta, which is the main language there at the moment that's overtaken uh, lots of the other indigenous languages. And there's cultural events um, as well. Uh, so it's a collection that really is going to take a long time to document. Uh, and what, what the community wants is access. So we're also working on how the community can access the collection, what's, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, who are the people in the images. So it's going to take many, many years to fully document the collection, but also um, having the community uh, work on actually who, who are the right people to speak for 
uh, the right um, videos. Uh, there's a lot in there which is just everyday sporting events. So football was quite large uh, and very popular in Water, and they still have um, an annual competition. Uh, and there's lots of copies from grand finals going back to the early 80s. Um, so how does the community you know, want to actually be able to sort through all of this collection and then see what's freely, avail what's f freely available for the general public, uh, what's available just in-house with the community. And it comes down to what Terry was talking about before. It's sort of like a, um, a lot of issues around copyright, intellectual property, indigenous intellectual property and protocols as well. So these, we, we took the water collection as a whole of collection and we took a, a conservation and preservation approach because we really didn't want it to, um, uh, if, if a cyclone came along, you just don't want this sort of valuable collection destroyed. Uh, but now is the hard, the next stage is the hard bit, which is documenting the collection uh, and then putting a right structure around that collection. Uh, one of the good things that happened just after Christmas, and actually a big shout out to Jordan, uh, Mark, Scott and Patrick in what air, uh, when they watch, when they get to watch this. Uh, and and um, what, what Scott and Jordan had managed to do was have the community come in and look at the collection and view it and help document it and then attribute right holders to particular events in the collection. What they managed to do was get this up as a CDEP activity and it's taken several years to actually negotiate that as a work for the doll activity program. So it was good to see uh, that cultural activities now can become part of a CDEP program. They've stopped the CDEP work for the doll during Convy 19 and I, you know, one hopes that they might not go back to the old ways of doing things. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is um, Calac. This is a shout out to um, Neil, um, Tom, Wayne, uh, Ari and Robin from Calac. Uh, Wayne uh, presented here a few weeks ago. And um, so big shout out to Wayne for his great words of wisdom. So this is a photograph. So I worked with the Grimwade Centre for Cultural Materials Conservation at the University of Melbourne. Uh, they want to, uh, I don't actually work in their department, but I utilise their con conservation students. So over a number of years, I think it was uh, 2017 and 2018, I took um, two groups of conservation students up. So we basically went through the Calac archive, which has 30 years of history there. They've got an art collection. They've got a multimedia collection. And of course, um, uh, I've worked with Neil Carter as well on repatriation of ancestral remains and Tom on cultural heritage matters. Um, so we basically took, again, with Calac, took a whole of collection approach and sorted through the entire collection. We also found lots of um, material, uh, audio visual material, both uh, sound recordings on old reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes. We also found lots of material on mini DV tapes, again, uh, we engaged the services of IATSIS um, to help digitise the audiovisual collection. Um, one of the things that we have been working with uh, is First Nations Media Australia and working up um, some protocols around archiving and a national archiving strategy. I'm just posting uh, a link to this here. So a shout out to Daniel Featherstone and others at First Nations Media. So we've been working on developing protocols for um, archiving in regional and remote communities. As you can imagine, the media sector, and a big shout out to Dev as well. Um, uh, and as you imagine with the media sector, they, they have developed these vast audio visual collections over the last 30 years as well, uh, that desperately need archiving. Uh, what we found is many communities uh, don't want their collections left uh, to leave the community and want them kept on site. So. Uh, First Nations Media have been working up a national archiving strategy, but also trying to set up funds uh, for a digitisation centre. So there were plans for one in Alice Springs going ahead this year, but that's been put on hold due to Con V. And again, um, what we find, it's very difficult to, to find um, sources of funding just to do archive projects. So having, having students come and help has just just been immensely valuable for Calac, for Wad Air and the other communities in which we work. Um, we're often called out to offer advice around um, preserving these vast collections. And 
these collections are, you know, thousands of years of Australian history embedded in, in these collections, whether it be uh, a whole series of interviews that were done uh, about 20 years ago uh, for Calac for, to produce a book. Um, which, and and the, the, the oral histories that um, can never be recovered. So you don't really, you really want to manage these collections into the future. One of the things that I talk about with regional remote um, Aboriginal communities is they should be considered a nationally distributed collection and we should have a national framework to support managing and running these local community collections. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, there's never enough funding to go around to manage this day-to-day -day operations of, of these historic collections. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to stop there. Uh, I don't think there's any more slides. No, that's the last slide there, Lyndon. It is. Um, it's interesting, um, look, how, what kind of recommendations do you have for handling copyright of traditional materials then? What are the um, you suggest? Now, we're just, just a little word of warning, we've now turned off this, the PowerPoint so we can now see your faces. So oh. don't do too, anything too revealing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, look, I've, I've posted a few uh, things in the, in the link there and um, the strategies for First Nations Australia for archiving. One of the things I've never really got caught up with, but I've had lots of conversations with Terry and we, we were often on panels together at conferences. We were on one last year or the year before at the National Film Sound uh, talking, talking about similar issues. I've never really gone down a legal IP copyright um, uh, issue with this. I really take, because if you do, you could get caught you can get very much tangled up. So I've taken a approach where it's a preservation needs process rather than getting concerned about the copyright. Now the copyright, now that we've secured the water audio visual collection and the community has a full set back, now is the time that we start thinking about those protocols. Um, and another, another thing that we're trying to think about is the copyright holder may be someone that's taken the film, but all the intellectual property should remain with the communities of origin whose performance it was that the copyright holder did. So we've got a little project at the moment uh, working with Dr. Um, Dominic Sweeney, who uh, did a documentary called Corroborees of the Northwest. So we're looking at, and we've got some legal advice around this, uh, and looking at how him as the copyright owner can actually release his copyright and share it with communities. Um, so that they can use it in their everyday activities. Well, so this is a very interesting point because I know that if you are in full um, regalia, let's say full paint up, and yeah. someone takes a photo of you, the person who took the photo owns the image. This is yeah. right, Terry, isn't it? And and how do you negotiate? How do you pull out some negotiation uh, uh, mm. strategies to to look at the intellectual properties and moral rights in that environment, Terry? What, what do you think? That's why I would, I would say have the written agreements at the time people are coming in to record cultural performances, uh, stories, like we have clients who are being asked to tell their stories, for example, of their stolen generation story, um, but they want to know where does that story go when someone is filming it, can they use it for other purposes? So we're writing agreements for those people so that they can control because there's performers' rights, but also at the point that you still have the story and you haven't given it away, you can have it in writing. So that, in, that will give you um, a contract right to control um, and, um, and get the copyright back to you. So mm -hmm. if you're filming me, I could say, only on condition that you assign the copyright to me and it will be in effect. So what, that means that you would have to ask those questions and have those protocols at the point when everything's being created. Can I say another point on old heritage that's existing recorded? And I like Lyndon's comment there about um, uh, access to other people's copyright of collections, if it's films or um, even if you've written significant materials like language resources, you know, linguists have written language resources of Ab by talking to Aboriginal people. And by the general operations of copyright law, the law will deem that they own copyright. Mm. 
Mm. So they don't even have to have anything in writing. That's the general principle. So uh, for things that have gone, these legacy materials, what I'm seeing now is some of these people are assigning the copyright, not just giving the materials back, because I mean, that's good, but make sure that they're also assigning the copyright over to the community. So the community, you know, it could be a community organisation on behalf of um, the community, or it might be the language person who gave you all that knowledge to own the copyright. You can do that in a deed. And I really think that's important now, not just the physical ownership, but in all the ways Lyndon's talking with digitisation, we want to have the copyright back so we can um, put it in, you know, new apps for, for children. Children want to be able to create, create VR experiences. So that's, we need to have that within our, um, no, coming back to us. It's interesting. This reminds me that you know Disney have actually trademarked uh, 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 Hakuna Matata, which is a Swahili um, phrase, which means no worries, no problems, and they trademarked it to put it into the Lion King. And so this whole idea of how do how do the legal structures work? How legally binding are these kind of contracts or agreements that you're saying that? people go in and get a, a get a contract signed up that says that we will uh, honour your copyright and the use of that copyright as a community, but then they take it away and they find some other application for it. I mean, can you as a community take that that contract for usage and, and use that in a court of law or to protect the sovereignty? I think you can. You can. The, the, the answer is, it depends what, the, what you say, what the of the um, what rights are taken in the in, in the um, consent form because um, it's all in the wording but let's say that you do get the rights we do have them but it's just like with copyright there's no copyright police it's up to you to enforce those rights so you've got to write the letters and take the action against the person which can be really hard if can't afford to take the take it to court. Courts are very expensive, you know. Or also, the, just the different positions of one um, the person coming in, taking the knowledge, having more power than the community. The person. And then a whole, whole idea of traditional materials, as you were saying before. And I'll ask Linda this question. You know, who owns these images? Who owns these? Um, uh, I imagine recordings of maybe ceremony or dance, at least, if not the sporting events. Who owns them and who do you then negotiate with over the, the copyright um, uh, regulations and law and that kind of thing? What's your advice to those listening? Um, well, for instance, in Wattab, Mark Croken would be the copyright holder of a majority of that collection. But he, he, of course, says, actually, no, I'm giving my copyright in this collection back to the community and back to the museum uh, for the community to use and control. One, another interesting aspect of copyright is communities can actually go out and, for instance, write their traditional song or story, perhaps, publish it themselves, they would then own the copyright. And that's one way of getting around uh, some of that, that copyright issue. Uh, I know that people have trademarked Indigenous, uh, particular Indigenous designs and images. It's another way that the community might be able to control, control some of that. Um, and I think Wes might want to chip in on the chat uh, around some of that, uh, the work that Calac's done in that space as well. Um, but it's important, and uh, for instance, the remote media sector has created vast collections, and of course, um, hopefully, the you know their organisations retain and hold the copyright to that particular material as well. Um, but one of the things that concerns me in this is community being able to continue to maintain control and access over a long period of time. Um, it's great that we've now digitised these collections, but we're also now, you're moving from a format, for instance, a film on a VHS was very stable for about 30 years. But as everyone here on the chat would probably know, we're constantly losing a hard drive or a hard drive breaks down. We're not backing it up properly. So we're moving into a digital age, even though we've got a lot of 
free content to create quite quickly. It's also a very fragile environment in terms of archiving. So making sure now that the communities have all of their digital content, you have two or three backups offsite from the community as well. And you might want to, want to lodge material with one of our national institutions. So I know, for instance, the Mooka Centre in, in Yirrkala uh, has a vast collection of petabyte um, of material that they've had digitally returned uh, from organisations such as iAccess National Film Sound Archive for recordings uh, from Northeast Arnhem Land. But they also uh, are now creating vast amounts of their own content but, you know, the more content you have, the more higher the, your digital risk of losing material in, in the long run. But what they do is they basically send hard drives down to the National Film and Sound Archive as a backup of newly created content, whether it's, whether the, it's, it's filming a particular ceremony for a particular clan group that they might go out and do, or whether it's a documentary. Um, in fact, it's worth um, chucking a link to the Mooka project uh, in the... Yeah. Um, it, it's great. Uh, uh, Wes Morris has just put in the idea that trademark uh, uh, over the Wanjina is interesting. You know, um, it, back on uh, back on the right path, and and uh, yeah. but it's very hardcore for people too. You know, how do you trademark things? How do you move from sometimes oral traditions and traditions passed down family to family, the communal ownership? How do you transfer that to other ways? And I'm going to oh, also, there's a question here, Lyndon, about how to get involved in this digitization centre initiative. If you can whack yeah. us a link or something there. Yeah. So I, I think the best way of, for, for doing that is um, contacting, uh, if, if you want to help, um, contacting First Nations media or, or myself or actually Daniel Featherstone um, is, I won't post his his um, email, but there's, there's a link to, again, to the First Nations Media Archiving Project. And um, if you're interested, you can just type in my name and my email address and come up through the university system. Excellent. Wesley, Terry, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Wesley, I just wanted to make a couple of comments um, that there was a recent um, a situation with the Netflix program, um, Afterlife, where Ricky Gervais, uh, in one of his scenes, had an Indigenous painting behind him. And it wasn't accredited to the artist, but the artist challenged and got payment for it. So he had to pay for it. Um, so if you speak up and you see those things and you question how those things come about behind you, um, it's interesting. So, you know, the artist was able to get um, remunerated for that. Um, the other thing is, Linda, Nate, you would know about Ara Iridja uh, here right. in South Australia, which is owned by the Pitjantjara Council. So yeah. it's an archival, digital archive of people who have worked out in the APY lands over years. And, you know, when I first got involved with that, I mean, there was something like 2,000 images. It's now got, you know, 200,000 plus. Yeah. But in terms of the work that I do in remote communities, that's a depository. So everything that you do in terms of if it's Black Knight, which I produced, which was a youth showcase, all of that material that we do goes in there for the future. Um, so they are very important um, uh, place keeping places. The other thing that I would say with the infrastructure around the federal government at the moment, they're really wanting to push the economy. And so they're talking about big infrastructure pro projects one of the things that's been raised is should we have a national Aboriginal art gallery or cultural centre? And that's looking, you know, there's two places for that, Adelaide and Alice Springs. You know, is there capacity to have one of those in every city, for example? Um, but I would say to that as well, if infrastructure and state governments are looking and councils are looking at infrastructure, why not start building those keeping places in, in communities? Mm -hmm. where they can hold their own places, uh, their own materials. So I just wanted to put that out there as a, yeah. as a comment. Marvellous. We might come back to Terry. We're going to wind up in, in a moment there, Terry. Just those last words of encouragement. How, how do those who are getting engaged now, as Leanne's kind of telling us, how do we build these centres? How do we look after the paperwork and the materials? What do you give as recommendations for those people who are wanting to protect cultural knowledge in the digital space as well as uh, in the analog spaces? Where do you go? What do you suggest? Well, I'd suggest build the policy, um, build a protocol which is going to give you the framework for your strategy 
I think what a lot of communities are um, reacting to people coming. So if they set up a system, it could be based on those true tracks principles, but then you need to get your terms of engagement in your agreements. And I think that will help you um, stop a lot of the seepage of culture that, that has occurred. And you could have within uh, those agreements that the right for it to come back to the keeping place and for there to be rights for that community to use and adapt that cultural heritage um, piece that's being created. I think people don't understand that they can actually and um, they can actually negotiate for these rights. And you know, time and time again, they're getting researchers, filmmakers coming in, but if you turn it around, you can do it. But if we all do it, it sets a standard. And that's the beauty of the Australia Council protocols and the beauty of the Screen Australia protocols, because then the funders are saying, if you don't comply, you're not getting funding. So Australia Council does that well, Screen Australia does too. But some of the others that maybe it's the Australian Research Council funders, they need to come online too. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of conversation here. Magella Edwards is also talking about um, the stability and longevity of digital content, uh, noticing that cloud storage and blockchain technologies mean that there's a long term preservation of this digital content. And how do we make sure that these traditional cultural expressions uh, make sure they have this ownership and connection back to their source and that there that if there is innovation or movement in that that it's held by those copyright moral rights holders as well um leanne we're going to say goodbye to lyndon and, and terry now they're gonna to go off into their next meetings as they got the Bye, next meeting in five ten minutes can i just say thank you so much dr lyndon orman parker and of course the Dr. Terry Janke for your amazing contribution and the, the chat box just full of people saying how amazing and how thoughtful that you've been in bringing all that together. Um, I'm sure Leanne will join me thanking you. Yeah, thank you. And it was such a rich conversation and presentations. Um, you know, it was just encouraging to see the Q&A boxes opening. I'd just like to say too that if there wasn't any questions answered in that Q&A box, I'd ask the team to grab some of that and perhaps that we could pass them on uh, in some sort of way, but get those answered uh, in the next little while. But thank you both. Your work is so important and um, you know as a practitioner and as deputy chair of Australia Council for the Arts you know I certainly value all that you do because it's all a part of the ecology and it's all a part of making sure that we keep the integrity of our culture and our heritage so I, I wish you both a lovely weekend and a very happy Friday <laughs> Thank you, Wesley. It's always great to host with you. Oh, we're well, not finished yet. We oh, aren't we? And I'm, and I'm just. No, you can't. I'm just going to say goodbye to our people. I've just, I've just posted um, the Indigenous Cultural Heritage Conference coming up at the end of the year in Melbourne. Hopefully, that will still go ahead. Uh, there's calls for papers, and it's entitled "Taking Control of Our Heritage." So it's the 24th, 26th of November, and where we're going to have it broader discussion around all of these issues. So um, thank, thanks everyone for having thanks, us. Thanks, Lyndon. Bye, Bye. Terry. All Bye. those, don't go yet. We've got a couple of things just to finish up with. If we go to back to the PowerPoint presentation, please, Michelle. Um, just the next slide is just talk. Oh, come back to us. There we are. Um, just talking about some of the resources that are around, some of the monies that you can get uh, access to if you don't already know. Oh, I see people leaving the room but there's um, some monies there to help support uh, um, artists in all their different ways. Just a quick little reminder, this Playwriting Australia deadline is the 24th of May, which is this Sunday. So get, in to, get on, on that as well. And the uh, Theatre Network of Australia has uh, crisis cash, $1,000 for independent artists to go in there and look at um, getting some support. There's $1,000 for a thousand artists, we hope. So get in there and, and get uh, get part of that. Remember, it's until the dollars run out, so you've got to get in mm. quick. Next slide, thanks, Michelle. Um, also, there's some resources around your mental health, and I don't know about you, Leanne, but I'm feeling it at the moment, just where your brain's going and how it's working your way through. 
beyond. Oh, absolutely. Um, also some resources in indigenous languages to get a hold of uh, and some resources in English, which is aimed for uh, indigenous communities in remote areas as well. Get hold of that. Uh, lots of people in the chat saying very useful session, lots of really helpful hints there. And remember that you can go back and have a look at um, uh, and listen to all of this again from the Australia Council website. Next slide, thanks, Michelle. So as we're saying then, the Australia Council website there that you can access these round tables is also the Creative Connections and the Resilience Fund, which we'll talk about in a second. The money's there and support to get out there. Um, yes, Helena, it's all there on the list of resources is there on the OSCO website. You can get in there and have a look at it. And also some COVID-19 information um, from the Australian government. Uh, and there's a Facebook group. If you haven't got hold of this, it's some wonderful discussion and sharing happening there as well, Leanne, to, yeah. to, to kind of look at. The next slide, thanks. Leanne, you might want to talk a little bit about grants updates. Um, look, we've got um, look a number of uh, things happening uh, in terms of our grants. So, look, I, I just really, uh, I think we've got one coming up next week, a deadline. So, look, get on, get on um, the Australia Council website. There are lots of opportunities out there. Like Wesley said, there is there's money out there. But once it runs out, it runs out. So don't wait. Please get on it. We've got the Resilience Fund um, for, uh, with three areas, Survive, Adapt and Create. That closing okay. date is the 28th the next, of May. The next slide will... Oh, there it is there, right in front of Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wesley. <laughs> I was saying before how you know, these spaces and kind of cultural spaces too, how how often we kind of interrupt each other because we don't know when things are finished or not moved on. But yeah, these, these uh, resilience funds are there for that support. And we really, really need First Nations people to take advantage of these so that you're not left. I mean, many people finding it difficult to some conversations about how to write the ground applications, yes. especially if you're an individual artist or those who work in the performing arts, I've been told, finding it difficult because often they're used to collaborative ways of, putting together grant applications, suddenly finding themselves by themselves. So there's always that to keep looking at. And the next slide, please. The next round table. Um, well, we've got the uh, in the First Nations Arts Awards, which Leanne, you talked about earlier, which is happening live on Wednesday the 27th at 6 p.m. Sydney time. Check out all the time differences across the nation to get in there and go on the Australia Council website and find the link to the app so then you can be part of it. You can give your comments as you do here now, but also give messages of congratulations to the artists who are winning. This is one of the first times that the artists won't be all together. They won't get that celebration of, uh, you know, several hundred people in a room. So the more we can make them feel special, the more, well, it's what we do, isn't it, about community, looking after people. The Red Ochre Award, the Dreaming Award from the, from those elders who have really contributed over decades and decades of their life and practice and those young artists or young artists who's just come in and ready to kind of jump into their practice we'll be looking at that and we'll have a little bit of a conversation about the first nations arts awards at next week's round table oh that's that's oh leanne that was some big ideas going on there wasn't there big ideas. oh really big ideas and um <clears throat> look i look there was a comment here too by Sharina, sorry. Yeah, Sharina. Yeah, um, please go to that website. She's asking if I can apply for a survive fund and the create um, as well, or just one of them. Can you apply for all three or two? Or is it just one of those three uh, areas under the resilience fund? So um, Sharina, we'll get one of our team to respond to you on that. Um, if you could, please, those who are in the background there. Um, look, it's it's just so fantastic to have everybody come on board uh, and support our speakers. It's a really great way for us to wrap up our week, I guess, Wesley. Uh, I know, I mean, it's a long week for everyone, but the days go really quickly. I always look forward to Friday afternoon. Uh, it's, it's great to see your smiling face all the time. <laughs> I, I feel buoyant in myself. And just a big congratulations to everyone out there who's found their way through two and a half months of this lockdown. Just take the time to celebrate yourself. Celebrate yourself at every chance you get. 
be with your family, be with your community, wash your hands, make sure that you give people lots of love because that's the most important thing. As we wind up, we'll see you next week, Leanne, won't we? And we'll be hopefully seeing you also on Wednesday at the First Nations Arts Awards. So lots of love to everyone. Leanne, wrap us up. Oh, look, I think everyone just have a fabulous Friday evening. Be kind on the weekend. Get out in the sunshine. Get in the garden. And we'll do it all again next week. Yeah. Love to see you all at the uh, First Nations Arts Awards, too, on the 27th. Uh, as you. we kick off Reconciliation Week, Wesley. Yes, Reconciliation Week. See everyone in the back. Thank you very much uh, for everyone in the back room who's supporting yeah. this. Thanks, team. Thank you again, team. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.